Our focus today is the window of the cross that is the redeeming, the making good of human suffering. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, who went not to glory first, but suffered on the cross, grant that we might see the power that your death has in the midst of a world such as this. It's in your name that we pray, asking that your Holy Spirit would indeed illumine us as we read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. From 1 Peter 4, we read, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or even a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, as one who is in Christ, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust themselves to a faithful creator while doing good. Now is the time when you participate in agreement that this is God's word, that though we can't know everything, what is revealed is precious. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. <clears throat> and we may do all the words of this law. Well, suffering is inevitable through the wear and tear of daily life, through the loss of loved ones, through persecution, through accidents, through calamities. There is no way around it. You're probably suffering something now. If not, don't wait very long. It will happen. There's simply no way around the fact that to be living in a world such as this, we suffer. The question is, what perspective do we take on the suffering of the world? In particular, what does the cross have to say about human suffering? Is it any different than that which other religions and other philosophies offer us? Well, I have four layers through which I'd like to look at suffering with you today. And the first one is this. The cross tells us not to be surprised by the reality of suffering. We should not be shocked as Christians. Rather, we partake of a certain degree of realism about life in the world. You saw what Peter said. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal when it comes among you. When stuff happens, it's normal. Now, it astounds me, actually, uh, living in a post-Christian culture, how surprised people who have no thought of this are when acts of terrorism occur or when accidents happen, or when a hurricane blows through. They stand with perfectly um, stunned faces, asking for the first time, why does this happen? If there's a God, how could God let this occur? Now, I try to be patient. I, I try to be patient, particularly with people who are in pain. But as a guy who's been studying theology a long time, I want to ask, are you just now thinking about that? Has it just dawned on you, the awareness of your personal suffering? Do you not know that in the time we had this conversation, 10 children have died of starvation? That every hour of every day, landslides tumble, cars crash, cancers kill, boats sink? When did you think you were going to be an exception to this rule? We get accused as Christians of living an illusion of, of we're the people that are so heavenly minded we're no earthly good, pie in the sky, by and by. That's wrong. There's no other religion on the face of the earth that looks reality so squarely in the jaw and says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon you as if something strange were occurring. We expect it. Life in the world is suffering. It is loss. It is grief. It is bodily breakdown, it is accident, it is calamity. We face it understanding that the God who created the world free with its own existence 
who is a good and loving God, has created a world where evil actually occurs and accidents happen. We struggle with that, but we're not surprised by it. That's the first thing to say about suffering. It's a reality, and Christian realism sails straight into that headwind and says we face it straight up. No blinders, no expectation that aging and death is going to make an exception in our case. If that's all we had to say, we would simply be joining the cynics of the world who say, yes, I expect things to go wrong. But thankfully, we have a whole lot more to say, don't we? The cross not only tells us not to be surprised at suffering, number two, the cross tells us that God is with us in suffering. Now, that may seem like an old news to you, but you know, it's different than every other philosophy or religion on the face of the earth. You know, the brave cynic who says there is no God, the atheist says, I am alone in my suffering, and I face it as bravely as I can. Other religions say God is removed from the human problem. He would not sully himself with getting down in our midst. Still other religions would say there is no such thing as a personal God. There is just a force, a oneness to which we are all returning. The idea that a God would be personally interested in my suffering is ridiculous. We believe that our God is with us present in suffering. The book of Hebrews is so eloquent about this. Let's see the quote from Hebrews up there. It says, since the children, that would be us, share in flesh and blood, God himself partook of the same things. Our God stepped into the world so that he could experience from within the life of suffering that you and I experience. He took up skin and bones, raw nerve endings, experienced fatigue, Rejection, exhaustion, difficulty. Hebrews goes on to say that he himself uttered loud cries in his supplications. God perfected the one who was already perfect through suffering. Scripture says that God stepped into the world in order to suffer, not just on the cross, but through an entire lifetime of faithful living in the face of the resistance and the loss we all face. Don't you find that when you're going through something that it makes all the difference if there's someone who will come alongside you and simply be with you or hold your hand or even better do those things and say, I know what you've been through. I've been through that heart surgery too. Let me tell you, I know that your chest hurts right now. I've felt it. Think about my father the time he went through his colon cancer surgery, my dad was not known as a person of many words. Now, I knew that he had just pages and pages of poetry running through his mind all the time. He read and remembered all kinds of things, but never felt like he had any particular need to share those with people. In fact, this week, my brother sent me, he found a copy of the 1936 Episcopal High School yearbook. There was my dad's picture in there, and he was called the school philosopher. He didn't say much, but what he said mattered. Now, I know from talking to Dad that what they actually called him was the Sphinx. Something was going on in the mind, but he didn't need to say anything, unlike his son who needs to say everything he thinks, feels, or wants to talk about. Well, so when my dad did speak, it was often important. And that afternoon when we went into the recovery room, when he was waking up from the surgery, he didn't have much to say. But he reached a very weak hand towards my mother, and he smiled a little smile, and he said just four words before he went back to sleep. He said, your presence, so great. Isn't that the whole deal in the midst of our suffering? Your presence, so great. If someone could just come along beside me and stand with me in it, And let me know they understand from within what I've been through. It changes everything. That's the news of the cross for us. We look at Christ on the cross and we see him there bearing our infirmities, having experienced the most excruciating pain that a human can experience, utter forsakenness and abandonment, so that whatever we're going through, when we look at the cross, we say to him, Lord, your presence so great. God is with us in our suffering. 
But it gets better, doesn't it? Third thing is that God, the cross tells us that God gives purpose to our suffering. He uses it for our good. It's difficult to endure something if it seems to be for no purpose. Sort of like being stopped on the interstate because someone has slowed down to look at a rabbit being chased by a dog. It's like, there is no purpose for this slowdown. An hour and a half for nothing. But if there's a reason for the suffering, if something's coming out of it, you say, okay, I, I can take it. Now, suffering appears to us to be such a waste. And if you look at the cross from that angle, you think, how could it be that we as the human race would take the finest man that ever lived, Jesus Christ, and in the prime of his life say, you need to die now? Why did that happen? Think of all the parables he had left to tell. Think of all the healings he could have done, all the people he could have saved, all the good he could have accomplished. How is it that when God came in our midst in Jesus Christ and he was healing people, when his body touched another body, that broken body got well and we decided, nah, we want to break your body. One drop of his precious blood is enough to cleanse the foulest sinner. And we said, no, I think we should spill your blood onto the ground like, like bile, just waste, get rid of it. We rejected him in the prime of his life. It appears to be an utter waste. But God had different ideas about that. And in fact, the suffering that Jesus underwent was not waste at all. You might even say that the most productive act of God among us was to suffer and die for us. He specializes in that. Taking what we suffer and using it as the building material to change our lives. It's a great mystery. Suffering seems to me to be a waste. I don't want it. It's interrupting my life. And God says, oh, no, it's not. This is exactly what I'm using in your life to grow you, to deepen you. Now, of course, we face a choice about that. Have you known people who are just like suffering magnets? It seems like they want it. And it's not because they, they want to be tried and used by God. It's because they want to just be angry and bitter at the world. They are miserable, and they invite further misery. They expect people to slight them. They find it at the drop of a hat. They expect people to reject them. And so they're so unattractive that people do. They expect their body to break down. And when you live that way, of course you get sick. And they just feeds on itself and they become miserable and embittered people. Suffering only adds to the waste of their existence. By contrast, have you seen Christians suffer? Person upon person in this congregation would testify that it was in the midst of suffering that we discovered a deeper joy. That it was through the pain that God drew us closer to himself. There's a woman in our church who in the last three years, and she allowed me to tell this, has gone through the loss of her dear mother, two treatments for breast cancer, radiation and chemo, acute facial pain and three surgeries for that, and the loss of her husband into rapid dementia. And she says, I would not trade the last three years for anything. The closeness I feel to my church family the depth of intimacy I have has occurred with my husband even as I've lost his mind. And above all, the precious presence of my Savior in my life is worth more than anything to me. I count these years as most blessed. That is the mystery of Christian realism when God transforms our suffering. We don't become bitter by it. We don't deny it in illusion. We embrace it as something that God is using, and everything changes. There are dozens of you who've testified to that in our midst. The cross gives purpose to our suffering, for there God made the most horrific waste into the greatest fruitfulness. Well, so far, so good, I hope. I think you probably know most of this and have experienced it. Well, this fourth thing is a little different. It's a little bit more mystical. It's the fact that our suffering can connect us to Christ on the cross. We can get 
mystically connected to Jesus' suffering through what we suffer. When Peter said, don't be surprised at the fiery or trial that comes among you as if something strange were happening to you, he went on to say, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. That word for sharing is a word we've talked about before, koinonia, fellowship, communion, participation, is a mystical, spiritual partaking. It's the same word we use for communion at the table. We get joined to Jesus in the koinonia, the bonding of the Lord's Supper. So Peter is saying, rejoice, for you partake mystically, spiritually, truly, of Christ's sufferings in your suffering. That's wild, isn't it? It changes everything. It turns my suffering into being not about me, but about Christ. And that's the way that I'm healed by His wounds. Most of us don't think about this most of the time. It requires a counterintuitive thought effort. It requires a spiritual imagination. It requires a sailing away from natural reaction into a counter-natural reaction. You know, if you're hammering something, and if you're like me, thumbs and hammers were meant to go together. Bang! The thumb cries out, Ow! Stop it! Stop it! Hold me! Get me some ice! It's about me! Of course it does. That's what pain receptors are for. But this number four says, counterintuitively says, no, it's actually not about you. Your suffering is meant to vault you out of yourself and into the presence of Christ Jesus. To sail against it and say, even as I'm experiencing this pain, I am being linked to the pain that Christ feels for a broken and lost world, and I'm getting closer to His heartbeat for His people through it. How does this work? Let's take a mom, a mom who loves to give to her children. Let's take a mom of adolescence. You know that time when children are so delightful, so appreciative, so verbal about all of that. Here's a mom who wants to do what she has been doing for 17 years, from the time she was changing diapers and changing clothes, usually about 30 seconds before you leave for church. Something comes up from one hole or the other that causes an entire change. This same mom is packing lunches, doing laundry, giving cash, lending a car, giving encouraging words, complimenting appearance. And the reply of the teenager is indifference. At the very time when this person on the edge of adulthood should be rising up and saying to mom, you are blessed. I crown you with thankfulness. (laughs) This didn't happen in your house? (laughs) Instead, what happens is the barbs of snide remarks, the thorn of neglect. The mom is given a crown of thorns. And suddenly, in her prayer, she realizes, I get it now, Jesus. You came to us to give your life, and we scorned you. We should have crowned you as the King of kings and Lord of lords and said we jammed piercing thorns upon your head and made you bleed. I feel that now. Take me up into your love for a world full of prodigal sons and daughters. Take me up into your broken heart for a people who remain indifferent to all your bounty towards us, let me share in what you are experiencing. And then her wounds are joining her to the wounds of Christ. My friend Dawn Eden wrote this in a book. She said, there is room in the wounds of Christ for your wounds. Rich wounds yet visible above and beauty glorified. Christ showed the nail prints in his resurrected body to Thomas. He bears those wounds still and says, there is room for all of your wounds in mine. If you would lift beyond yourself. Peter said, for by his wounds you are healed. Not by your self-help group, not by your prescription, not by the salve that heals of physical wounds, but by Christ's wounds, 
Your wounds are healed. Somehow, to have total healing from all I've suffered, I've got to be connected to Christ. How do you do that? Well, Peter told us that as well. He said, you imitate Jesus. He said in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, when Christ was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was cursed, he blessed. He continued entrusting himself to his Father. So Peter would repeat in chapter 4, so let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust themselves to a faithful creator and continue to do good. When we are in pain, we think, all right, this is the moment God's abandoned me. He took care of me all the way to this point, now he's quit on me. Peter says, no, right in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of the grief, when the pain is crying out, then when you don't feel God at all, do the counterintuitive thing. Call him your faithful father. Praise him for being your creator and commit yourself to him. When Jesus was hung on the cross with his arms outstretched, he cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? This man who was as close to God as anybody who ever breathed in skin felt no presence of his Father, no trace of him in the universe. And he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So we too, when we want to curse, praise. When we want to be sidelined by pain, continue to do good. And then we get the mystical link. Let me close with an illustration. A few weeks ago when we talked about the cross as sacrifice and offering, we looked at the story of God requiring Abraham to offer Isaac, his only son whom he loved. We connected it to the cross where the father offered his only son to us. And I told you the story of my friend Rhonda Smith, the musician, who in working on a song about the sacrifice of Isaac had a breakthrough in the grief she had from losing a young son years before. Well, after that sermon, I realized I needed to get in touch with Rhonda again. It had been a long time. So I Facebooked with her, and not coincidentally, turns out she's studying to be a Methodist pastor. And she had just preached a sermon where she told the story of the day of that son's funeral as a way to deal with grief. And reading her sermon, I discovered why she had been open to that moment of breakthrough in the basement working on the song. She talked about that day right before the funeral began when they were gathered around the graveside. And she said she watched her second son on the shoulders of his grandfather. And she looked at her husband with his drooping, sagging shoulders as the little tiny casket was put down into the grave. And she looked around at her family with her and the children that she had. And she said, all of a sudden, I knew what I had to do. And she sang. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gates will open wide. He will wash away our sins. Let this little child come in. She said she saw her husband straighten up. She saw her second son reach towards her. She scooped him into her arms. She said, in the moment when I wanted to curse God and I sang, I realized I had returned to my God. I had returned to my Creator, to the one who had also lost a son, and not merely to accident, but to brutal rejection and horrifying pain. In that moment, counterintuitively, when we might have been unable to speak or too embarrassed to utter a word, she sang. She praised. She entrusted her life and her entire family to God. You never get over such a loss. But it was that step of faithfulness and worship that allowed the healing to continue all the way through to those years of the breakthrough. The mystery of the cross and the redeeming of our suffering is that we have completely realistic eyes about the reality that we will suffer even as our Lord did. That He is with us in that suffering, that He knows how it is with us, and not one bit of our pain or suffering needs to be wasted. He makes it into something else. But even more, 
when we mystically, counterintuitively, imaginatively find the connection between our pain and the sufferings of Christ, we get lifted beyond ourselves and discover it's not about me, it's about Him. And as we are gazing upon Him, dismissing the pain that is screaming, we discover the truth that by His wounds, we are healed. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, though some of us in this room do not feel you now, into your hands we commit our spirits. Oh, Lord, though it is counter to the screaming of our suffering, we praise you as the God who has endured all that we have endured and more, as the God who is transforming suffering into the building materials of faithful lives. Join us to your heartbeat for this lost and broken world. Let our woundedness propel, you, propel us into being with you, taking the blessing of the cross to the ends of the earth. Amen.